I'm going to read a story from my collection, The Parrot's Tale. This story is entitled The Stratagems of Archimedes. In 1906, a medieval palimpsest containing the previously unknown work Method of Mechanical Theorems by Archimedes surfaced in Turkey. Beneath the Greek Orthodox prayers written on the vellum codex was found yet another lost manuscript by a follower of Archimedes. It relates an alternate history of the siege of Syracuse. I've translated it, annotating some of the more obscure passages, and put it into a historical context so that we can better understand the fantastical inventions attributed to Archimedes in this forgotten manuscript. What follows is a retelling of that lost history. Marcus Claudius Marcellus, the celebrated Roman general who had finished off the Gauls and battled the Carthaginians to a standstill, and who now stood at the gates of Syracuse, the Greek city-state in Sicily, was so confident of victory over the besieged and isolated fortress that he instructed his navy to begin emptying their holds for the expected war booty. The ships lined up in formation and began to make their way into the abandoned harbor, steering directly for the defenseless city. Little did they know what stratagems the elderly mathematician and inventor Archimedes had devised to thwart their every move. Syracuse was a prosperous state that grew rich on its central location in the Mediterranean. It was able to capitalize on trade with Rome, Greece, and Carthage, free from entangling alliances and treaties. But with Rome's expansion and wars against Greece and Carthage, Syracuse's freebooting days were coming to an end. The looming threat of Roman conquest forced King Hieron II to sign on with the Carthaginians for protection. Syracuse felt safe under the aegis. Hannibal had recently handed the Romans their worst defeat ever at Cannae. However, as a result, the Roman Senate decreed that not only Carthage, but all of its allies be destroyed. Claudius Marcellus had been called out of retirement by the Senate to pacify Sicily, whatever the cost. Thus Syracuse was caught in the crossfire, and they sided with the army that had so recently slaughtered the Romans and nearly captured Rome itself. But in the ensuing battles, the Carthaginians were no match for the military genius of Marcellus, and they beat a hasty retreat back to Carthage, abandoning Syracuse to the Romans. This is where Archimedes made his entrance. Although nearly 80 years old, he was still regarded as the preeminent mathematician of the known world, and in his application of mathematics to mechanics, he was a pioneer. In his career, he discovered methods for determining surface area and volume. He was an expert on hydrostatics, becoming legendary for proving King Heron's crown to be an amalgam of silver and gold, not the pure gold its maker had promised. His cry of Eureka as he ran naked from his bath is probably apocryphal, but it demonstrates that he was regarded as a master scientist, boarding on a sorcerer by the common people. Marcellus knew very well who Archimedes was. He had read his treatises on levers, block and tackle, and other engineering devices. Marcellus held Archimedes in the highest regard, and one of his main goals was to capture him alive and pry further engineering secrets from him, secrets that would give the Romans an advantage in their war against Carthage. However much Marcellus respected Archimedes, he had no idea what level of mastery the old inventor had reached in devising battle machinery. Marcellus had prepared for the expected barrages of Greek fire by shielding his ships with tarps made of hides covered in snake skin. That's what the ancients called asbestos. He had prepared and retrained his new cavalry of elephants stolen from the retreating Carthaginians. They were to pull his catapults to the walls and later act as battering rams against the city gates. His siege engines had been covered with iron plates to deflect burning spears and arrows. He also had a secret weapon. Marcellus had loaded his catapults with diseased animals that would bring plague and death to the prostate city. Thus began a thoroughly overwhelming siege and hope for a quick victory. It had all the marks of a modern war, biological weapons included. The first sign that the battle was going to be a long one was when Marcellus's fleet, sailing into the empty harbor in tight formations, successfully ran the gauntlet of Archimedes' first launch from his catapults only to face a continuing wave of stones, even as they sailed forward. The master of the lever had outfitted numerous catapults of varying length, giving him a full range to fire on the incoming fleet. Marcellus had faced Greek catapults before, and he was always victorious, but this was something entirely new. The Greeks of Syracuse were calibrating the fleet's very advance and adjusting their catapults to place him under continual fire, 
He couldn't retreat with his fleet in such tight formation, and so he was forced to sail on, losing nearly half of his ships before reaching the defensive walls that rose straight up from the rocky shore. Marcellus disembarked with his bodyguards and reconnoitered with his co-commander, Appius Claudius Pulcher, to configure strategy. Meanwhile, Marcellus's ships had anchored directly under the walls of the fortress. No longer in range of the catapults, his infantry was free to attack using their mobile towers mounted on the ship's decks. But as the ships maneuvered to within striking distance, they were met by underwater grappling hooks that lifted their prows high into the air and dashed them like toys onto the rocks that lay at the foot of the city's fortifications. Marcellus's ships should have been able to grapple onto the walls and attack the city while his co-commander, Appius Claudius, pressed from behind with his mighty siege engines and battle-hardened infantry. It was inexplicable how the ships had been wrecked while there were no defending ships in the harbor. Surviving sailors told the general that as they sailed close to the walls, giant metal claws on massive wooden beams had risen from the waterbed. The claws seized the prows of their ships, and with ropes extending back into the fort, teams of horses pulled them up with oversized block and tackle. Marcellus now bitterly recalled one of Archimedes' most famous sayings, Give me a place to stand, and I will move the world. The world of Marcellus and Rome had been upended and dashed on that one calm day in August. The people of Syracuse celebrated the naval victory that night. Marcellus could hear their music and shouts of joy, shouts he was now determined to silence forever. The next day, as the city still danced in the streets, Marcellus ordered up his catapults to launch their diseased artillery into the unsuspecting crowds. It was an opportunity that Marcellus had dearly hoped for. He would need every advantage he could get to defeat Archimedes. At noon, with the reveling in the city at its height, the Roman soldiers forced their captured Carthaginian slaves to load anthrax-infected cattle and horses into the catapults. The elephants then pulled the massive engines to within launch range. As the hot August sun filled the sky, Marcellus prepared to give the order to exterminate Syracuse. He even rode to the top of a hill overlooking the walls to better enjoy the final moments of this impudent city. The heat of the noonday sun would help the anthrax plague to spread quickly. The disease would mean certain death for everyone behind the city walls. But when he looked out over his troops and onto the besieged fortress, he was blinded by an increasingly bright light emanating from the ramparts. How could that be? The sun was directly above him, not behind the walls of Syracuse. As he lifted his hand to give the final command to launch the deadly cargo, he saw his engines bursting into flame. There were no enemy troops nearby. The weapons had been sealed in protective iron. As Marcellus screamed more orders, his army turned and retreated towards him, their clothes on fire, their engines idle, their tightly wound rope winches smoldering and unraveling, leaving the troops to fight the fires and inhale the infected air. High on the walls, Archimedes and his soldiers stood with polished brass shields, shaped to the perfect parabolas necessary for concentrating the light and turning it into fiery heat rays. They were aiming directly at Marcellus's mass troops and siege machinery. The general stood dumbfounded at the route that was unfolding below him. He could just make out Archimedes as he directed the rays at more and more of the retreating troops. The battlefield was a no-man's land now, with the deadly anthrax poison polluting the air. In desperation, Marcellus ordered one last thrust by his elephants to ram open the city gates. The riders whipped the elephants into a frenzied stampede. Over 100 of the terrified behemoths bore down on the city. If Marcellus could just batter down one of the gates, his reserve troops could gain entry to the city. But before the stampeding pachyderms could reach the wooden gates, Archimedes released swarms of mice that the citizens had collected from their warehouses. Squealing baby pigs were added to the throng. When the mice and pigs were released, they ran headlong towards the advancing elephants. To escape the fires that had been lit behind them, the mice ran right under the hoofs of the massive beasts. In the melee that followed, the elephants reared up, throwing their riders to the ground, and barreled back into the straggling troops, trampling hundreds of soldiers and nearly upending Marcellus on his horse. The Romans fled to the mountains to regroup from another total rout. When the city recovered from its celebrations, Archimedes spoke to the citizens about the struggle that still lay ahead. He told them of how Marcellus had captured other cities in Sicily, beat and tortured the captives, and then beheaded them. He told them that Rome was an implacable foe and they should prepare for a long siege. 
Marcellus would never give up unless totally defeated in battle. Archimedes went to work on his next plans. He directed troops to sneak out of the city using the tunnels that had been dug in anticipation of the siege. The tunnels led under the walls and deep into the countryside where the soldiers could surface unnoticed. The troops then proceeded in darkness towards the nearby Mount Etna volcano. The mountain was not in eruption, but streams of lava were continually flowing down the hillsides and into the sea. Before the Roman attack, Archimedes had prepared canals to divert the flows of lava into a stone aqueduct that led from a nearby spring to the fields where most of the Romans were now encamped. Brass gates were swung closed on the flowing lava, forcing it into the canals and then into the aqueduct where it flowed relentlessly towards the unsuspecting Roman camp. That evening, the soldiers noticed a red glow in the sky where the lava ran just above their heads. They thought they were seeing just the first signs of dawn. When the magma arrived directly over the camp, sluice gates opened and fiery molten lava rained down on Marcellus' trenches, creating further canals for the lava to spread. The night was a scene from hell as liquid fire engulfed the entire Roman camp. Bucket brigades and water were useless against the implacable rivers of lava that washed over the entire campsite. The soldiers who escaped vowed never to fight this magician and sorcerer ever again. It was all Marcellus could do to keep the troops from mutiny. But still he would not retreat. He began his own plan of counterattack. Marcellus brought fresh troops from Italy, troops that were unaware of the legends of Archimedes. He ordered a nighttime siege by sea that Archimedes couldn't employ his heat rays. He also prepared against the underwater grappling claws by sending sponge divers brought from Greece down to cut the ropes connecting them to the block and tackle in the city. Syracuse once again lay prostrate to a full frontal assault from the sea. Marcellus himself led the fleet into battle one moonless night. He would finally capture and destroy Syracuse. He had left nothing to chance. With black sails raised, the fleet glided into the darkened harbor, but they spied a dim ball of light rising from the Acropolis within the city. It was rising from the temple to Zeus that stood on the peak. What could it be? They sailed on, getting ever closer to this mysterious glow. Little did they know that Archimedes had taken another incredible leap of invention. He had created a flying sphere, stitching together almost an acre of silk and sealing it with a light tar, he fashioned the cloth into a large balloon. Then he attached a basket below and with the aid of a naphtha fire and leather bellows, he filled the ball with hot air. He had seen a smaller version of this device when he had studied at Alexandria. It was regarded as nothing more than a toy. Archimedes turned it into a powerful weapon that would frighten the Roman sailors back to Italy. In the moonless dark, the balloon rose, glowing and silent like the evening star. The sailors stopped rowing and stood on their decks, transfixed by the artificial planet. What followed caused them to return to their oars and begin rowing in reverse, frantically trying to escape. Archimedes had painted the full head of the bearded Jupiter on the outside of his silk contraption. From the ground, it appeared as though the head of the mighty Roman god was floating in the air, the glow from the fire illuminating it from within. The gods must have taken the side of Syracuse, murmured the Roman soldiers. Surely all of the Romans will die. Marcellus tried to tell the sailors of the tricks of Archimedes, but they were convinced that Jupiter himself was coming through the air to punish them. And when Archimedes started dropping burning embers onto the stalled ships, the sailors were convinced that the mighty sky god was casting lightning bolts down on their ships. They dove into the water and swam for their lives to the shore where they were captured by the waiting Syracusan army. Only Marcellus and his retinue escaped. When Marcellus returned to Rome in disgrace, the Senate was on the verge of imprisoning him and, commanding, and his commanding officers, but on account of his previous victories over the Carthaginians, he was given one more chance. To ensure his victory, the Senate granted him the combined armies and navies of Greece and Spain. They were sure that with such an overpowering force, Syracuse would finally be crushed and Carthage soon after. Cartago delenda est. Carthage must be destroyed. They pledged in unison. As the combined armies and navy sailed for Sicily, Archimedes himself was sailing his new balloon aircraft over them, unseen above the clouds. He was destined for Carthage, where he would rally the army of Hannibal against Rome. But more importantly, he would make contact with his brother scientist, with whom he had studied at Alexandria. When Archimedes arrived in Carthage, he told of the desperate position of the city. Hannibal agreed to help fight the bitter enemy they both shared. 
Since Rome was abandoning Spain, the Carthaginian general could free up his own army and navy to engage Rome in Sicily once again. He sent his brother Hasdrubal to direct the mustering of the forces, but he was told it might take up to two years to recover from the last war. Archimedes didn't have time to wait. He met with some of his fellow Greek philosophers and enlisted them in the battle. They shared with him their latest discoveries from a recent trip to Alexandria. They enrolled papyrus rolls that showed Egyptian engineers building the pyramids and Cheops. In the drawing, massive clothed wings attached to ropes were seen pulling one-ton building blocks with the aid of the wind. Using what would later come to be called kites, the Egyptians had been able to move the sandstone blocks on wooden rollers the miles it took to reach the building site. These techniques had been lost and only recently rediscovered in the dusty basement of the library at Alexandria. No one other than the Greek philosophers knew of their existence. They made plans to build more of these kites to aid Syracuse. The next day, the scientist sailed with Archimedes in his balloon back to the besieged city, arriving back in Syracuse well ahead of the arriving Romans. The scientists worked with Archimedes to build the kites, and within days they had ten working craft. When the mighty Roman fleet and combined armies advanced into the harbor, they were prepared for a final showdown with Archimedes. Marcellus had armed his forces with their own reflecting shields to aim the heat rays of Archimedes back against him. The Romans would turn the tables on him and incinerate Syracuse once and for all. They were prepared for anything Archimedes could throw at them, that is, until the day of battle came. As the fleet approached, Archimedes once again launched his Jupiter-headed balloon. Marcellus laughed at his childish attempt to frighten his men again. They had been warned about Archimedes' tricks. Marcellus was already prepared for the ensuing aerial barrage of burning embers. He told his men not to worry, even though there was murmuring in the ranks. The asbestos tarps would protect the ships, and the reflecting shields would bring certain end to the old magus. The fleet continued to move steadily forward. You have defied my order to leave Syracuse in peace. I must now destroy you, bellowed the giant head from above employing three megaphones and thunderous sounding sheets of brass beaten like gongs. The Jupiter had then retreated back into the city, reined in by ropes, while simultaneously the ten kites were launched from behind the ramparts. What could Archimedes have planned now? The sailors couldn't move even after the screams of Marcellus ordered them to sail on. They had never seen anything like this. Were these angels or gods? The faces of Mars and Hercules and Vulcan and many others could be seen flying through the air. As the sailors stood motionless on the decks, the kites lowered the hooks that grabbed hold of officers and soldiers, lifting them into the air and then releasing them from the sky to die crushed on the decks in front of their companions. A new route was underway. As Marcellus fought off one of the trolling hooks, he ordered a full retreat from the harbor. He knew now that he had no chance of destroying Syracuse while the old Magus was in control. With direct confrontation out of the question, Marcellus vowed to starve the city into submission. Within days, his troops blocked every road, every pass, every sea lane that led to Syracuse. They then settled in for the death watch. After two years of siege, the city had run out of food and water. The 80,000 citizens were finally defeated. But Marcellus did not know that. With Archimedes in command, anything could happen. The Roman general had no idea how much longer the siege would last, so he was dumbfounded when Archimedes himself appeared on the walls and offered peace and a ransom for his fellow citizens. In a letter, he offered 10,000 ingots of gold if the citizens of Syracuse would be given free passage. Marcellus could then occupy the city and claim victory. 10,000 ingots of gold? That was the equivalent of 20 years of tribute from all of Rome's colonies. Syracuse was indeed the richest of city-states. Marcellus could use this horde to totally dominate and destroy Carthage. Of course he would accept, with one proviso, Archimedes alone was to remain in the city. All of the others could leave in Roman ships. With bitterness, Archimedes agreed to Marcellus' demand. But Archimedes had one last stratagem. When he had returned from Carthage with the other scientists, he brought along one of the most mysterious devices of the ancient world. His companions had recently traveled to Babylon and brought back an implement that could generate power, much like that found when amber was rubbed with fur. It was a device that today would be called a battery. It produced enough power with its copper and tin poles immersed in acid to electroplate metals. 
During the two weeks that he had negotiated for the handover of the cities, Archimedes and his soldiers covered thousands of lead bars in a light gold film using the Babylonian battery. On the day that had been set for the exchange of the gold for the city, Marcellus lined up his abandoned ships and watched the city emptied out and took control of them, setting sail for Carthage. The 10,000 ingots of gold lay in a pyramid just outside the city gate. Marcellus had inspected and counted them himself. As the defeated populace sailed over the horizon, Marcellus and his army marched triumphantly into the city through the now open gates. Soldiers then loaded the gold into the 50 carts necessary for transport to Panormus, the Roman-controlled port in northern Sicily. Marcellus had won. The Roman Senate would honor him with a triumphal parade and a rich retirement. The laurels of fame awaited him at home. He now controlled the city and the whole of Sicily. He possessed the greatest gold hoard in history, and best of all, he had captured Archimedes. Marcellus had demanded that Archimedes remain in view throughout the transfer to ensure that no new subterfuges or escapes were possible for the wily artifacts Maximus. Archimedes could be seen throughout the day, standing on the dome of the Acropolis, waving farewell to his fellow citizens. He was still there as night fell, an eerie glow from fiery torches illuminating his form. At the appointed moment, Marcellus proudly entered the Temple of Zeus and strode across the marble floor to the dome where Archimedes still stood. What secrets he would learn from the master. As Marcellus approached the portion of the dome where Archimedes stood, he reached out to grasp his hand, but touched only the cold stone of the surface. How could that be? Archimedes stood before him with outstretched hands. Once again, he grasped for the form of his nemesis and grasped only air, almost tottering off the edge of the narrow ledge. It was then that Marcellus saw the crystal lens that focused an image of the magus on the wall of the dome. On the floor of the temple lay a painting of Archimedes waving, a mirror, some torches, and a lens of crystal that focused the image on the wall. A wheel carried various images of Archimedes as it rotated. It appeared as though he moved, waved, turned. It was magic. He had lost once again to the sorcerer, but it was not a totally bitter loss. He had won the gold and the city. He would now send his swiftest boats to overtake the escaping Syracuse fleet and its protector, Archimedes. As Marcellus swirled his purple cape and turned to leave the temple, one of his soldiers approached, bowing and stammering something about a false gold hoard. The soldiers that had loaded the gold had dropped some of the ingots and scraped off the thin gold shell. The ingots were all worthless lead. Furthermore, a mighty navy was now filling the harbor. The navy was led by Hasdrubal. As Marcellus looked out the window, hundreds of ships were slowly taking control of the harbor. In the prow of the lead ship was Archimedes himself. He was aiming some kind of round metal tube that spewed smoke and fire. As he watched dumbfounded, Marcellus saw the outer gate blown to bits by a flying projectile shot from Archimedes' new engine of war. Thus ends the once lost history recorded by Zosimus. The previous histories of Polybius, Livy, and Plutarch are thus revealed as Roman propaganda, manufactured to show Rome defeating and killing Archimedes. And even though Rome did finally prevail over Sicily and Carthage, Archimedes went on to live to an even riper old age in his beloved library of Alexandria. We will never know how many of his discoveries were lost when that monument was destroyed in the siege by Julius Caesar.